this cube of brass, if I were to measure one of its sides, you'd see that the side length is two centimeters. And the other side is two centimeters, and it is two centimeters, because this is a cube. Now, two times two times two, two times two times two, is eight. There are eight centimeters cubed in this shape. Now, if you imagine it, imagine cutting it in half. The bottom would have four cubes, and the top would have four cubes, altogether eight centimetres cubed of brass. Now, I'm going to use the Eureka can here and the measuring cylinder to find out how many millilitres there are in eight centimetre cubed. So off we go, as usual. Let it all trickle out. More trickly drips. And there we go. There are, in fact, eight millilitres in eight centimetre cubed. Now that means that one centimetre cubed of solid volume is equal to one millilitre of liquid volume. Now to find the density of a liquid I don't need the Eureka can, because I can find the volume just by pouring it into a measuring cylinder. So what is the density of water? Well, the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put the measuring cylinder on the scales, and I'm going to tear it there, which means I've set it to zero. So as far as it's concerned, it's already taken into account the mass of the measuring cylinder. And I'm going to pour a little bit of water in. Of course, there's more sensible ways of doing this than doing it with the Eureka can, but hey, it's all fine. And I'm going to pour in as much as I can. And I've poured in far too much, and I've also made a right mess of this. That's not good. It's all... Okay, let's, let's try and get rid of some. See, the Eureka can was not the tool for the job. I can't quite get just the right amount in. There. Now I think that's about right. 10 millilitres. And it's about 10 grams. Not quite exactly, uh, because I'm just slightly short. But you get the idea here that the mass 10 grams divided by 10 millilitres is going to give us a volume of 1 gram per millimetre. Every single millilitre of this is one gram's worth. And that's a different way of expressing the density. Rather than one gram per centimetre cubed, I could say it's one gram per millilitre, and it means the same thing. But what if we had a different substance? So let's now try the oil. Excuse me while I just get the water off my scales, which is obviously going to cause problems. I'm going to now very, very carefully pour some oil, okay, we are all right, into this. And then I'm going to see how much 10 millilitres of the oil, um, how much mass it has. So I'm going to very carefully trickle 10 millilitres of oil into here. And I've actually got more control this time than I did when I was doing it with the Eureka can. There, precision. So now 10 millilitres of oil, on it goes. Huh, only nine grams. So, if the mass is nine and we divide it by 10, then it has a density of 0 0.9 grams per milliliter. It means that the density of this liquid, oil, is less than the density of this water. So what should happen if I pour this on top, you would find that having a lower density enables it to float. Put my finger over the end and we can see the oil is now floating 
on top of the water. And this is a key thing. If you as a liquid are immiscible, which means you won't mix in, and you have a density less than water, you will float on the surface. And so when there is an oil spill into the sea, what we find is the oil stays on the surface. But it's more than that. It's not just liquids of lower density than water that will float on water. I have here some ice. And you'll notice that this ice floats. Like icebergs. You see, the ice itself has a lower density than water. That this much ice if I allowed this to melt, it would produce a pool of water of smaller volume than this ice cube. It means that if I filled drink up with ice and it melted, it would never overflow. If anything, the water level would drop. The actual liquid water occupies a smaller volume than the frozen water. And what it means is that ice, the solid, has a lower density than liquid water and so it floats and this is why we have floating ice at the North Pole and icebergs and the sinking of the Titanic is all to do with the density of ice. This is just some aluminium foil. What I'm doing is I'm making a little model of the Titanic. And quite obviously, that looks like and is the Titanic. Now I'm going to set it afloat, and you can see it floats ever so well, and I'm going to even put in some heavy weights in with it. So, a bit of iron, drop it in there, and it still floats! But the iron has a greater density than water. So why can it float? Oh. Well, why did it float to start with is because the shape of the boat meant that trapped underneath the water line was a big pocket of air. Now that meant that the average density across all of that volume was not just the density of the iron, but it was the density of the air pocket trapped inside the hull of the Titanic. But then what happened is, it unfortunately touched one of these ice cubes and that destabilised it and water started to get in, replacing the air. And so then there was nothing to cancel out the weight of that iron, the average density rose above that of water and the poor thing sank. Oh, sad times. <laughs>